Welcome to Module 2 of Architecture 347-547. In this module, we're going to look at a slightly more advanced set of structural concepts, looking in particular at structural elements. When we talk about structural elements, we're talking about individual pieces that do the job of carrying loads in a building from a floor, say, all the way down to a foundation. And what we'll do in the next few weeks is we'll trace these loads through this series of elements and we'll look at the kind of mechanics, how each one of these elements works to carry a load either across a span uh, or down through it through a building. As we do this, we're always concerned, of course, with efficiency. So we'll be using those mechanics to look at how we can fine tune each element so that it performs best. And usually what that means is we're looking for ways to carry the most possible load with the least possible material. Sometimes we switch that up. We're concerned more maybe with depth or with dimension uh, than we are with the, the amount of material that we're using, but usually these two things are related. We're looking to use the least possible steel or timber or concrete, or maybe we're looking in a high rise, especially to carry loads with the least possible dimension right, or, or depth. At the very end of the module, We'll start to think about how these pieces all go together, but we'll save a lot of the kind of macro scale behavior of, of what happens when we have systems of these elements uh, for a later class. There will be some math uh, to this. It's important to understand uh, the mechanics, to understand what the engineers are going to be looking at when they design our structural elements. As an architect, you will never actually design a beam using the math that, that, that we go through. You'll usually hand that off to engineers, but it's useful, of course, to understand their process. And the math in some cases is not only helpful in terms of understanding the nuts and bolts of each of these elements, it can actually be really kind of beautiful. Uh, the way that we see loads distributing themselves through a beam, for instance, when we talk about shear moment diagrams, We'll talk about geometries and mathematical relationships and proportions that end up informing a lot of our architectural decisions as well. And particularly when we're talking about beams and slabs, we'll be looking at them in, in two directions. So both longitudinal, what makes a good beam or slab shape in the direction that it's spanning, and also cross-sectional, uh, what makes a good or efficient beam or slab uh, in, its, in its section or where the material is actually distributed. There'll be five basic topics uh, that we'll cover in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, each of these topics will have its own sort of set of videos. There'll be maybe three or four videos for each of the topics, breaking that down so that, uh, first of all, we're using a little bit less bandwidth, uh, but also so that we're keeping things tight. You can go back and review individual topics uh, fairly easily by pulling one video out of the lecture series and focusing on that. The five topics we'll look uh, in this set of lectures, we'll look at, or this set of videos, we'll look at equilibrium. We'll review a little bit about statics, what we mean by loads, the different types of equilibrium, and then we'll look very specifically at beam equilibrium. And we'll do this because there are a few mathematical tricks that we use to start out understanding beam behavior. And one of those is what the external loads are uh, that have to keep a beam in place uh, and fixed uh, in, it, in its position. So that'll be week one. We'll move on then to beam design. This is probably going to be the, the heaviest or, or, or trickiest uh, of, the, of the lectures to get through. We'll do a lot of examples though so that hopefully um, it, gets, it gets easier as we go on. We'll talk about the graphic methods that we use to understand beam behavior, what goes on inside a beam in addition to what goes on outside a beam. And then we'll look at the, the what I call the cross-sectional mechanics. We'll get to this uh, number called a section modulus that's critical for understanding what makes a, a beam particularly strong in terms of its shape and how we use that to actually design or specify uh, shapes, steel shapes in particular. Steel lends itself really easily to design by section modulus. And so we'll do a whole ton of examples on how we design steel beams. We'll go through a, a bunch of these so that we get used to the, to the process, but also so that we understand exactly how the, the, the beams are actually working. We'll switch it up and talk about column design. We've talked about this a little bit um, in uh, previous classes, but we'll talk in detail about the, the real problems that we run into in columns that make them more difficult to design than simply compression. And we'll do some specifications and design of columns using what we call the slenderness ratio methods. <clears throat> 
And then finally, we'll look at two, the, the two kind of structural elements that are at the opposite ends. Slabs that pick up our, uh, our loads and take them to beams, and then foundations that take the loads from columns and spread them out uh, over soil below. There are a lot of similarities in the way that slabs and foundations work, so we'll put them together. We'll understand uh, the mechanics of getting sometimes very heavy loads from uh, one system into the other. And then we'll delve deeply into foundations and look a little bit at soil mechanics and the types of foundations that we use uh, for each level of soil or each type of soil. And then finally, we will talk briefly about uh, overall framing, connections, how these pieces go together. But again, we'll save a lot of the kind of macro scale behavior uh, for, for future courses. So in this first set of lectures, we're going to talk about equilibrium. And to do that, we're going to first go back and review some uh, stuff from 345 and 346. Those courses will also have videos on the YouTube site. And you're welcome, of course, if there are things that are, you're maybe a little rusty with, uh, or if you want to go back and review, you're welcome to go deeply into those videos. They will be in a, an Architecture 345 and eventually an Architecture 346 uh, playlist. But for today, let's go back and look at a few uh, key concepts that we ought to remind ourselves of before we get into uh, beam equilibrium. If you remember, we talked mostly about vocabulary uh, in the first introductory structures courses. We talked about uh, what forces were and what loads were. Forces being the abstract arrows that we use to understand the flow of loads, which are the, the physical uh, weights and, and, uh, and, and pressures that we put onto buildings. And we talked also about the, the math behind this vector algebra and how we use arrows that have magnitude uh, direction and sensibility to understand the way that loads flow through uh, various structures. We talked also about equilibrium. We were studying statics, not dynamics. So the good news is that our answer is always zero. We always want our buildings to be uh, stable. We don't want them to fall down. We don't want them to tip over. Uh, and so we're looking for ways of mitigating the forces and loads that act on a building finding ways to direct those through the structure and finding ways to resist those so that our buildings stay in one place and so that they stay fixed so that they don't rotate or, or fall over. We looked at states of stress, uh, both in terms of uh, stress that acts uh, along an element, so what we call axial stresses, tension and compression. We talked briefly about non-axial stresses, in particular bending, which we'll get into uh, in, in quite a bit of detail uh, in, in the next couple of weeks. We also switched that around and talked about how materials resist stress. We, the relationship between stress and strain, which will be important in this course uh, when we talk about deflection and how we limit uh, or how we understand the way that, that materials uh, move and twist and, and deform under loading. Modulus of elasticity we talked about is an important comment or uh, uh, topic uh, the, the, the thing that actually gives a material its resistance to forces and loads, and also about what's called plastic and elastic behavior. So plastic behavior where we are uh, stressing a material, when we remove that force or load, it snaps back to its original dimension. Uh, elastic behavior where the, the material actually stretches out and is permanently deformed, and why we want to avoid that uh, usually at all costs. We looked also at some very simple structures design. Uh, tension structures and compression structures where all we were dealing with were axial loads. We use things like trigonometry and very simple algebra. Uh, allowable load equals allowable stress times area to calculate some very basic structural elements that were in pure tension or compression. What you should know before going into uh, this set of, of uh, classes is uh, a handful of skills. You should be able to uh, analyze forces and load paths through a structure using some simple algebra, using some trig. We'll do a couple of these uh, in, the, in the next couple of weeks to, to, to remind ourselves and to sort of get into these. Um, you should be able to size members based on loads and geometry for simple tension and compression situations. So again, allowable load equals allowable stress times area. And then finally, vector algebra will be important once again. Uh, and so the, the, the moments where we were using some trigonometry to figure out how loads flow through a simple truss, 
that sort of thing is going to be important uh, going forward when we talk about uh, talk about beam design. Throughout all of this, you should keep in mind the five S's. Uh, and you may remember going back, we talked about, usually when we're thinking of structures, we're talking about strength. So is the material, does it have the capacity to carry the load without uh, tearing or breaking or fracturing or crushing? But it related to this and also important is stiffness. Materials uh, resistance not only to, uh, uh, it, to enable it to carry the load, but to carry the load without moving too much or deflecting too much. Stiffness is often a component of serviceability where we're trying to find materials that we can use for appropriate uh, functions. And at the bigger scale, uh, something we'll talk about uh, when we're talking about beam equilibrium, stability. Uh, do we have ways of taking the object, assuming it's strong enough, stiff enough, doing the job that we want it to do? Um, do we have the external conditions that can support that uh, in a way that's stable. And you may recall discussion about things like three-legged stools, triangles, things like that being very good for stability. All of these, of course, relate to shape. And throughout all of our discussion of structure, what we're really concerned with is the shape of the element that we're going to use to carry a given load, either over a certain distance or down a, a building structure. And that shape is going to determine how much material we need, uh, where that material needs to go, how much load the, the, uh, the structural element can carry, how much it's going to deflect, and whether, of course, it's stable, right? whether it, it, it falls over, uh, even if it can carry the, carry the load. So remember these uh, going forward, right? the five S's, strength, stiffness, serviceability, stability, and all of these relate to shape. This is, the shape is what we're finally after at the end of the day. We're going to talk a lot about loads and converting loads into mathematical entities that we can manipulate, play around with, and calculate. So remember that we have a few different types of these. We have live and dead loads. Live loads are anything basically that can be moved around that may be in a building or on a floor uh, one day, may not be on that floor, maybe on a different floor the next. So people, uh, furniture. Uh, anything that's being stored, vehicles, anything that moves around in a building we count as a, as a live load. We have ways of estimating these usually for, for typical uh, functions. In addition to that, we have what are called dead loads. So dead loads are the structure's own self-weight, the, the weight of the material itself that we're using for the structural system. And then anything that's actually fixed to the building. So cladding, partitions, plumbing fixtures, uh, the footings for foundations, all of those count as uh, dead loads. We have some loads that are live loads that we treat specially uh, because they are particularly related to a building's site. Um, environmental loads include things like the weight of snow or ice or rain on a roof, uh, wind, if we're designing in a seismic zone, then seismic loads are, are a very big concern for us. We qualify those as environmental loads. Um, also in this, we'll count thermal expansion, the tendency of materials to grow or shrink as the weather gets hot or cold. And even though this may seem like a, a trivial thing, especially when we get into detailing something like cladding, or if we have some structure that's exposed to the weather and some structure that's not, we have to be careful about how those two things are gonna interact when one piece of structure may actually be a different size than the other because of the, the surrounding environment. Any of these loads can qualify as either a point load or a distributed load. A point load, we call any load that we can treat basically as a single arrow. So one very specific discrete point on a structure. So a single person uh, walking on a floor, their footprint is small enough that generally we would think of that as a single point. If you have two people, then that's two points. If we have 60 people, then all of a sudden we're not really so sure where each one of those points is. And we might instead treat that as a distributed load. Instead of saying that we have uh, 300 kilograms at one point, we might say we have 300 kilograms distributed over a 10 meter beam. And we would write that as 30 kilograms per meter. So that is a distributed load. We draw it using a series of arrows as you see here. And in some cases, 
when we're talking about beam equilibrium, we can do this. We can sum that up and we can take the total of the distributed load. So here's that 30 kilograms per meter spread across a beam. We can draw a single arrow at the center point of that load and say that we have a, a, a total uniformly distributed load in this case would be equal to a, a, a point load. So the point load equivalent of this distributed load would be 300 kilograms. And we would draw it at the center, not necessarily of the beam, but the center of the distributed load. So here we have a uniformly distributed load that traverses the entire 10 meter beam. We show that as uh, this series of arrows, and we write it as 30 kilograms per meter. Here we have a distributed load that's only taking up part of the beam. And we, again, have a 300 kilogram load, but we're going to make sure to draw that arrow, not necessarily in the center of the beam, but in the center of the load. And in this case, that's the center of the aquarium uh, itself. Point load, distributed load, this is the key thing to remember, that any of the loads we talked about uh, previously, dead loads, live loads, environmental loads, can be either single point loads, uh, a person walking on a, a slab is a live point load, or they can be distributed loads. Uh, a crowd of people walking on a slab is a distributed load. Uh, the weight of, the self-weight of a beam or a slab uh, is a distributed load. These are going to become particularly important when we try to get in and look at the mechanics of a beam and understand how forces are flowing uh, from loads on the beam into the, into the supports. So key to, to keep this in mind. The other key elements from previous classes to think about are equilibrium. And we talked about two different types of equilibrium, what we call translational equilibrium, where we're trying to keep the building from moving in space, and rotational equilibrium, where we're trying to keep the building fixed, in other words, in the same place, but also not rotating or spinning or falling over. The way to think about this is falling over, rotational equilibrium, falling down, translational equilibrium. So here on the left, we have uh, a building structure that has its own self-weight that's being resisted by uh, the material of the ground that it's sitting on. So it is in translational equi equilibrium in the y direction, the vertical direction, up and down. Its weight is equal and opposite to the resistant force uh, in, the, in the ground. Note, too, that we have two applied loads. These might be environmental loads. Point loads at the same height of the building of 100 pounds each. And logic says those two are going to cancel one another out. And this building structure is going to also be in equilibrium in the x direction. 100 pounds pushing left, 100 pounds pushing right, grand total of zero. Remember, that's the answer we're always looking for. So in x and y directions, horizontal and vertical, building structure is stable. And in this situation on the left, the building is also in rotational equilibrium. None of these loads have any leverage over the other. And so since they're all passing through the same center, the same point uh, in, the, um, in the structure, these two are passing through a point there, the weight and the resistance are passing through a point somewhere there. Nothing has any leverage. Nothing's be able to tilt the building over. It's in rotational equilibrium as well. On the right, we have a slightly different scenario where, again, we have the weight of the building being met by an equal and opposite resisting force in the ground. So it's in equilibrium in the y direction, translational equilibrium in the y direction. We have 100 pounds pushing from the left and 100 pounds pushing from the right. So it is in translational equilibrium in the x direction. But notice if we think through what's going on, if we're pushing high up on a building structure in one direction, we're pushing low on the, on the building in, in another one, we're going to basically undermine the building, right? It's, a, it's basically a knee tackle. And the building is going to tend to rotate. In this case, it's going to try to rotate clockwise. And we're going to have to come up with some force some internal force that resists that clockwise rotation. Uh, we'll refer to these as the, the, um, the overturning moment in this case. That is the 100 pounds uh, pushing in opposite directions. They're inducing a rotational force into the building. And to keep the building in rotational equilibrium, we're going to have to come up with an equal and opposite force, not in a linear direction, 
but notice now in the anti-clockwise direction, right? The direction opposite to the rotational force that's trying to tip the building over. The structures that we've designed so far were all simple columns and simple tension cables. So we were looking strictly at axial forces. What happens when we put a big pull onto a cable, as you see on the left, or a push onto a simple column? And these structures are relatively easy to design. We look at materials allowable stress. We look at the load that we want to put on that element. We divide the load by the allowable stress, and that gives us a cross-sectional area. And so long as the member that we're using, cable, rod, column, whatever, so long as that has enough cross-sectional area, it can resist a simple tension or compression force. There are exceptions that we'll get to in column design, but for the moment, that is an axially loaded member, fairly easy to design. Those, we need to understand tension, we need to understand compression, uh, maybe a little bit of shear here and there. All of those are relatively easy forces to contend with. In this uh, set of classes, and particularly when we talk about beam design, we will talk about bending. And this is the simultaneous presence of tension and compression. We'll do a little math to show how this relates to uh, that kind of offset rotational force that the, the, the 200 pound uh, loads were causing in our little tower a couple slides ago. And we'll talk about why this makes it much more complex even than you might think uh, to design a beam. What happens when we stretch out one side, uh, press together the other side, uh, what family of forces exist to, uh, to, to and, and how do we resist those adequately? To do this, we're going to back way up. We're going to talk about beam equilibrium, how we find uh, reactions to beams that will keep them in place, keep them from falling down or, or rotating. And then in the next week, we'll dive into the beam and we'll do some thought problems, some sort of uh, uh, thought exercises to see if we can actually get inside a beam and figure out what's going on kind of inch by inch uh, across the beam uh, as, as, it's, as it's loaded. Eventually, we will get to the point where our intuition about how beams work will have some math to go with it. So for the moment, as we're looking ahead, here are the questions that, that, that we want to be able to answer, not just intuitively, but mathematically. So for each one of these, do you, would you prefer to cross a short beam or a long beam? Which one of those is, is likely to work better? Uh, a deep beam or a shallow beam? Uh, a stiff beam or a flexible beam? And then here is the key one. We'll spend a lot of time on why this is uh, a beam with the same size, same dimension, but on its short edge uh, or its long edge. Each one of these has an answer that I would argue is very intuitive, right? A, a shorter beam we think of as stronger than a longer beam. Uh, a deeper beam we think of as stronger than a shallow beam. Stiff beam, stronger than a, 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 a flexible beam. And finally, a flat beam is weaker than a deep beam. It'll take us a, a few classes to get there, but we'll come back to this slide at the end of beam design, and we'll talk about the mathematics that go into each one of these kind of judgments. So for the moment, if anything that we've talked about is a little unfamiliar, um, go back to your 345 and 346 notes, brush up, uh, in the next video, we'll move on and we'll talk about beam equilibrium, translational and rotational equilibrium uh, of beams, how we use that to actually get at the, uh, the, the, the conditions that we need at beam supports to resist loads externally. We'll then take those and we'll dive into really fun stuff, shear moment diagrams uh, and understanding the mechanics of beams uh, and bending structural elements.